as sort of the topic, uh, I guess, states, solving critical development challenges and the roles of various stakeholders, uh, we thought instead of sort of talking about ourselves and what we do as organizations, it may be more interesting to actually do a live case study where we can talk about a sector and then see where each of us play within that sector. Uh, that way you can get a sense of, you know, what are the different roles that are needed in creating an ecosystem, and more importantly, I think, what are the gaps or honestly our inabilities in the models that we perhaps uh, perpetuate uh, and, and why there's a need to actually partner with other organizations that may be stronger uh, and better equipped to do some of the things that are required in creating and, <coughs> I guess, sustaining an ecosystem. And so with that, uh, we're not going to actually have introductions uh, of the panelists. I'm, I'm sure you guys can read about us. Uh, but we're going to actually get into the conversation. The, the topic we're going to choose today, uh, so it's more uh, tangible, I guess, is uh, the empowerment of adolescent girls. And the reason we're choosing this topic is because we've seen in our research that uh, if we do empower the adolescent girls of our country, you can add $110 billion to this economy. 110 billion. And I think from Dusra's perspective, and I think we've been very fortunate, uh, 15 years ago, I guess, when we started the organization, we had no capital, and, and, and we still have very limited capital. Uh, and, and I think because of that, we were forced to, from day one, look at building multi-sector partnerships. And so it's really my honor and privilege to be on stage with a group of individuals that we've worked closely with for many, many years. Uh, and it's, I think, my personal privilege, I guess, to be on stage at Suncult, uh, given that Vineet and I have known each other for about 13 years now. Um, and and it's, uh, it's a great honor for me to be sitting up on here uh, at an event which, you know, Vineet and his entire team has done, I think, a, a great, great job in executing. Uh, many of you guys know my wife, Neera. She was, of course, asked to speak at Suncult five years ago, which is probably a smart decision. <laughs> And it took Suncup a long time for, sort of, for me to come up on stage. So I think clearly somebody must have dropped out uh, for, for, me, for me to be here. Um, so, so I guess with that, we're going to start off the conversation. Um, and I'm going to start on, on this side with Susie. And again, if we're talking about empowering adolescent girls in India, uh, it would be great to talk about a little bit you know, on how your model uh, can actually help in, in creating sort of this ecosystem that's required, again, to add $110 billion to this economy. Sure. Yeah, thank you. So uh, what we said we would do is not talk about past work, but talk about how we would contribute if we were doing this imaginary project together. And my company, Verb, we partner with corporations and foundations to put on massive social <coughs> entrepreneurship competitions. And I know in the space of uh, empowering women and girls that one of the um, uh, sort of problems in the market is there not enough social enterprises targeting that population. And so part of the way that I could contribute is actually by organizing a large social entrepreneurship competition focused on empowering adolescent girls. Uh, one of our strengths is engaging with corporations, so it would be great to find a corporate sponsor for this competition. Um, and what we would do is uh, invite any social entrepreneur whose venture uh, could empower adolescent girls to enter into the competition. And then what we do with, the, with our corporate partners is actually engage their employees as the mentors and judges. Uh, so it gives a very specific role for other stakeholders to get involved in an active way. So a lot of problems, you know, like empowering adolescent girls, you want to engage multiple stakeholders. And the great thing about a competition is you have very specific roles that they can play versus just sitting around a table and having a conversation. So that's what I would offer to the group is a competition platform with a corporate partner to engage hundreds of social enterprises that could empower adolescent girls. Fantastic. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Vijaya? <laughs> no? Yes. Go ahead. Well, um, we will do five this year. Uh, we do them on different topics uh, and in different regions. We actually did one already on empowering women and girls. We had 600 ventures from 40 countries uh, that entered. 
And one of the really cool things about using a competition as a tool to solve a development problem is that you can incentivize social entrepreneurs that may be serving another population to suddenly consider this population as a new target audience. Mm. And so I think that would be one of our goals is maybe there are nonprofits or for-profit social entrepreneurs working uh, with, an, with a different group to incentivize them to come in and now apply their services for adolescent girls. Fantastic, mm -hmm. that's great. Janesh, you're, you're next. Yeah, hi, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, so I invest into food and agriculture technology uh, and when we invest in food and agri technology, we're trying to solve a few things, improve the yield, productivity and overall life of the farming, farming community. And when we do that, we, we try to use technology, we try to make investments. Uh, we're trying to solve a few basic problems, not for women or, or, or girls or anyone, it's for the entire mankind trying to reduce the, I mean, overcome the food security problem, trying to improve the lives of the basic poor people who probably would improve their, improve their own social standards. And as a group, when, if I were to contribute, I would still continue doing my job of investing in new technologies which is used by the Indian farmers, which would help them to improve their life because currently the farmers in the country are not making much. And so the girls and women of the entire farming community are not even able to get the basic livelihoods properly. So if I do my job and if I were to contribute to the group, I would still work on new technologies which would help to reduce the cost of farming, which would help reduce the usage of pesticides, abusive usage of pesticides in the farming community, which would not only reduce the cost of farming, but also improve the health, health standards because you are not consuming pesticides which are going to cause you livelihood, living problems. So that's what I continue to do about it, and that's how I think I would contribute to the group. No, no, that, that's fantastic. And I mean, I know, I mean, looking at some of, I guess, uh, some of the signs I, or, or some of the slides, I guess, on Omnivore, um, yeah. talking about sort of multilateral partnerships and multi-stakeholder partnerships, like you were saying, you guys are an investment fund, so yes. to speak. Um, yet, uh, you guys have partnered, I guess, from inception with a very, very large corporation, uh, the Gordridge Group. Uh, it would be interesting to, to sort of maybe share with the audience of what are some of the uh, you know, successes in terms of what has a large institution been able to bring you guys, and on the flip side, what are some of the things that you guys have been able to bring a large established institution? I mean, one for investors, the bread and butter is money, right? The large corporations gives money to us to invest because it helps them to get more returns. In addition to the money, they really help. If I were to make a new tech innovation in the farming sector, we need to change how the farming has to be done, right? And large corporations have a great R&D centers. They have a great scientists working for them. And they also have a significant distribution network. It's not only Godrej, but most of the investors uh, in my uh, fund, whether it's the few public sector units or few other large corporations, they give an access to the distribution to my farm, to my, my entrepreneurs, which helps them to reduce the cost of running the companies. Uh, and in, in a way, it's, it's a win-win situation. The companies make money because they're getting a new, new, new product in their system. But at the same time, it helps me to reach to more and more users, which would overall help the entire thing. Uh, in terms of in terms of gaps where we are, I think what we are trying to achieve is still a very limited focus, right? I mean, there are, I would invest into new tech, which is relevant for a lot of farmers, but there are a few, few farmers who can't even use our technology because they're still living below any kind of poverty line. Uh, so we're trying to work with various foundations, we're trying to work with various NGOs to help us to get their network, help us to reach, and we're working with our, our, our LPs to see if they can cross-subsidize those guys uh, which would help us to proliferate our business better. That's fantastic, yeah. thank you. Any questions for Janesh? So I guess let me put the ground rules. If there's no questions, we won't move forward. <laughs> Someone has to ask a question. <laughs> yes. Yes. 
and girls. So what is it we we're talking about? I mean, we've talked about sanitary towels a lot, um, but are there other products? And, and in the workshop that we had uh, earlier on this week, we talked about breast pumps as one idea. I mean, perhaps that's not suitable for adolescent girls, and, um, but, uh, but are there other products out there or other services that, uh, that are specifically targeted to that group? How do we define that? Because we need to understand that in order to invest. Thank you. I, I, so, so the question I think was, uh, what are some of the products and services that are required by adolescent girls, uh, which then allows entrepreneurs and innovators such as yourselves to start actually designing and thinking about, uh, you know, what are their needs and then appropriately uh, addressing those needs. And maybe Susie, because yeah. you, you talked about your business plan competition in this space. Well, I think actually what's, so the truth is that we don't have the answer. Right? So <clears throat> this brings up an interesting point in my world. Um, so when we think about impact, I think I often talk about how there's two kind of key elements. <coughs> there's innovation and there's entrepreneurship. And people ask me, you know, what is the relationship between innovation and entrepreneurship? And, you know, I live in Austin, Texas, where football is very popular, American football. And uh, so I often give the analogy that the relationship between innovation and entrepreneurship is like the football to the plays, that if you have the ball, but you don't have any plays, you're not going to score. And if you have all these great moves, but you don't have the ball, who cares, right? You're also not going to score. And so when we think about creating social impact and development, we, be, we need both really great ideas and flawless execution. Now, my entrepreneurship competitions work with existing entrepreneurs who already have an idea, who already have a venture, but I think implicit in the question you're asking is like, where do we source new ideas? And so you, we've also seen in the space the rise of things like hackathons and design challenges, um, where people are trying to collect better market information about what are the problems that we're trying to solve, what are the unmet needs. So I think for sure one of the things that's missing in our group is um, in, engaging with adolescent girls to really understand better what are their needs from their own voices, right? So that we can come up with true innovations, not just fund existing things, and not make paternalistic assumptions about what they need. Mm. Yeah, and just, just on that question, I think it's very clear what, what is needed. I mean, all the big family uh, planning programs, for instance, have addressed the issue of married women or girls after 18. And the biggest problems around the world, and especially in Africa and in Asia and in many developing countries too, are the adolescent girls and, and all the issue you have from the age of, of 13. And so, you know, you have many people who have addressed these issues since a long time. And I'm speaking, I'm thinking of BRAC in Bangladesh. I'm thinking of Grameen. They have done things which have really empowered women and girls. I heard the other day the founder of uh, BRAC, uh, which is one of the biggest NGO in the world. And he said, you know, Bangladesh, we started 30 and 40 years ago with Grameen to give loans to women in Bangladesh. And the result today is that Bangladesh is the second country after China for the garment industry. Because these women, once they had a loan, once they could put money into a, 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 a company, I mean, they were entrepreneurs. Uh, immediately have educated their daughters and their daughters after went to the city and have a work and have a job now, etc. So, so whatever we do to empower women and girls, uh, you have the benefit immediately, but you have also the benefit 30 years after, 40 years after, and, and this is very important. Regarding what we do at the Thomson Reuters Foundation to help on that, we have four main programs, but two of them are directly directed to trying to give services to people who need. One is trust law, and trust law is giving um, uh, lawyers who work for free to social enterprise and NGOs around the world. I created trust law three years and a half ago, and today we have more than 400 law firms members all over the world, 55 of them in India, 12 in mainland China, helping for free social enterprise and NGOs in all these countries. And, and 
so it looks very abstract, but it is not. Uh, I was in India this week, uh, and I was speaking with someone from Pharma, uh, Pharma Serve or Pharma Secure. Pharma Secure. It's a big NGO here, and and they said, you know, the impact that Trustlow had on my business is that I wanted to export forty thousand. Uh, 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 doses of malaria medicine to Nigeria. And we didn't have a lawyer. We could never have done that without the help of trust law. So the, the lawyers that we gave them allowed them to distribute to 40,000 people medicine for malaria. And you have non-ending help like this. Uh, an NGO in Vietnam that we also help uh, they are dealing with trafficking, which is one of the big issues that we cover at, at the foundation. And they are focused on trafficking, traffic of children. And they are suing the traffickers. And if we had not given them the lawyers to help them, to tell them how to prosecute them and how to best prepare the case, they would have done it by themselves. So all these you know, are very tangible things that we, we try to do for children, for girls, for women, for everybody more or less. That's great, the, buddy. The, the, other, the other one, very quickly, is Trust Women, which is a conference. And Trust Women last year, for instance, uh, addressed the issues of the, all these big programs that forget adolescent girls. And, and so you had people from China, from India, from everywhere speaking of these issues. And, and we helped them put connection, meet people, and try to address uh, issues. So we are here for that. Fantastic. Any questions for Monique? Yes, sir. Good morning. My name is Peter. I'm a social entrepreneur from Varanasi. Um, we train um, underprivileged teenagers, mainly girls, in photography skills. We sell about half a million of their pictures on postcards every year, and they get 50% of the profit to finance their own education. I totally acknowledge uh, the benefits that all these stakeholders on stage can have. We've won competitions, we have an investor, trust law is helping us with our legal issues, so that's all great. What my question is uh, to the uh, panel is, uh, how could you help us solve our biggest problem, which is finding, uh, changing the legal framework of the countries we're active in to uh, accommodate the specific characteristics of social enterprises. For us, it's very difficult to, within the India's legal framework, to employ 14, 15-year-old girls, have them uh, earn money for their education, but uh, keep it safe from their family, so save their earnings until they're able to spend it for education. That fits into no legal framework. Lawyers can be very creative, but they have to fit into a legal framework. So who could do advocacy, collect all these uh, necessities on changes in legal frameworks in India, and address that to the government so that hopefully there could be some uh, yeah, um, uh, solutions to these legal problems? <coughs> Maybe I can answer that. Uh, we, I have spent the week with meetings with law firms who are members of Trust Law in India here. And, and what they said is that they want to help a maximum, eh? and they do that for free. But what they need is training on the issues of uh, social enterprise and, and, what they, they, and, and NGOs, but essentially social enterprise because it's a world that they don't know very well. And they want to do a lot better. So they asked us to, 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 if there was a possibility that we train them. And we are going to do that because we think that indeed it would address a lot of issues that at first sight they are not the best place to, 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 to address. So that's one way. Great. No, and I think that's a great lead-in actually to Omidyar because they've uh, been a strong supporter globally in terms of governance and transparency and really enabling citizens within countries to take action and support civil society organizations that bring much more knowledge about uh, to all stakeholders. And, and maybe Anuradha, if you can talk a little bit about that. And maybe the nuances in India with our FCRA laws, which make it somewhat difficult uh, for these changes to take place. Sure. Um, I, I, and I, I'd love to do that. I'll just like uh, take a little bit time to explain specifically how we were also trying to address one of the things that you raised in your question, which was that uh, 14 is underage employment, and therefore like the, it requires a change for the legal framework and the labor laws and, and how you manage women. So it reminds me of a meeting a similar time last year when we were talking to the government about, um, about how do you change the entrepreneurship ecosystem and it requires changes at multiple levels. So why are we doing this? The toolkit which allows us within Omidyar Network to do, do this is um, 
advocacy and influence practice that we have and which, which moves, it's, it's a tool which is across the sectors that we function in. So if I want to do advocacy in education, I can do that. If I want to do edu uh, advocacy around entrepreneurship, I can do that. If I want to look at uh, where this actually coincides with what the government is offering us already, and then de deliver programs according to that. So that comes under the government transparency practice that he's talking uh, about as well. So just to step back and look at what we've been enabled with, um, is a set of diverse tools. We, uh, my daily job actually is to look for organizations which will help us de deliver different things to add in, in within sectors uh, and uh, we're using the toolkit that we have. So we can actually empower enterprises, completely for-profit enterprises, uh, which are very scalable and sustainable. We can actually invest in um, uh, social enterprises where we can see that the impact is very high. Uh, or we can, in, uh, we can also uh, provide grants to organizations which are working in addressing specific problems, um, or we can do advocacy. For us, advocacy is actually a very powerful lever, uh, right? If you look at impact, and if impact is defined as a change that you can get to the greatest number of people, then policy advocacy is an extremely important lever in that part of it. And um, that's something, but however, you need to use it judiciously. If there is a law in existence, there is a reason for that existence as well. And we don't want to, in fact, take away the spirit of that existence uh, and what it's trying to do. So um, we would like for, uh, for people to get enabled, but that doesn't mean they would, at the cost of others whose life can get disabled. So advocacy is a tool which we love to use, but we have to use it judiciously as such, right? So we look for organizations which have the capability to do that, and that's one of the things which is the most difficult thing to do, right? Um, if you look for organizations with an agenda, they, they, in, in the sense they're very good organizations, they have a very deep commitment to what they are doing, but the framework of, lo of, of looking is actually through that lens. So we might work with an organization which says that, um, uh, hey, I want to empower teenage girls to work and therefore it requires a change in labor laws, which is fantastic, but the, the opposing point of view is then what stops people from being forced into child labor? Right? So my, the, we have to balance both of that. So we do, we do empower organizations which do advocacy, but our point of view will always be balanced. So it is not definite that we will advocate a point of view. We look at organizations with, which advocate for that which is socially equitable and, and practically viable as well. Um, so, you know, you might have laws with the greatest of intentions, but they might not be executable at all. So we are looking at balancing that as well. Um, does that uh, yeah. um, answer? That's, oh, that's, yeah. that's, that's basically how I would uh, look at addressing the question. Well, I would like to add what we are doing, right? I mean, uh, when, when we look, we look from a very, very, very different perspective, right? Uh, people, child labor in this country is not because every, every parents want the kids to be working hard. There is a basic need, there is a, there is a desperate situation that they are forcing the kids to go. Right? So what we've been doing in our portfolio companies and what we are seeing the effect of that in the, I'm, I'm really focusing my discussion on the rural, rural area. We're seeing in our portfolio companies that we, we help our, our employees who are putting the kids in, in the work in portfolio companies to stop coming to offices and say we, we're going to sponsor them for the kids' education. And we're paying them extra salary to those parents saying, you, I'm going to give you a salary, so you don't worry. At the same time, I want to take care of your kid's education. Whether it's a girl or boy, we don't discriminate that. So we do that at a limited level. But what we have seen when, if you are a farming, in a, in a, in a farming community, girls, I mean, females are more work, I mean, there are more number of females working throughout the year, there are more number of males working in the farming community. And girls are working because the, the, the mother needs the support of the girl as for doing the labor job. So what we are seeing indirect impact that if you are using technology and if you're using a low cost technology, there's a more time available to the mother and the other, other housewives of the, of the farm, farming community that they are allowing their kids not to come to the farm. This was not we had initially envisaged out, but what we have re realized is that if you empower them to get more time, get more income from with the limited effort they have it, they don't want to send the kids to do the farming job. So maybe it's not advocacy, it's all about giving an extra level of income generation opportunities 
that might solve it. In this country, there are enough laws to prevent child labor. I mean, it's not about implementation. We can tell about it. I mean, there are a few ministers of, chief ministers of the state who makes a statement that girls should be employed or not, I mean, which is, which is against the law, but they do it, right? So it's not that we can do anything to prevent putting an advocacy which is going to solve the problem. You help them to generate more income, you help them to generate more opportunities, I mean, it's going to get resolved on its own. It's going to take time, but that's probably the only way. Right, I think. Not I to hijack the conversation, but just a quick <laughs> point that I would like to but add I will do out it anyway. here. <laughs> 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 is, um, so, you know, like one way of addressing these kind of issues is to look at where the empowerment angle lies with people, right? So if I were that's to look at, uh, at teenage girls, I would look at empowering them to education, uh, education and making them uh, decide what is it that they want to do and that cause actually like is much more powerful as to my deciding what should be an advocacy uh, angle out there as well so this, so sometimes that those are the kind of uh, um, balances that we do also um, so if you look at like um, our, our own portfolio organization which is uh, which earlier used to be a complete foundation which only trained people uh, we actually asked them to to create an arm which act, which em employs people as well and, and tip, this is an organization which all of you, or most of you at least, would have seen yesterday. I met it is the, is the company that I'm talking about. They employ um, uh, you know, uh, Muslim women in an area which has very little employment opportunities as such. So we understand that there is both angles to it. There is an empowerment angle, but you have to have an execution angle as well. And that part of it gets taken care of when, you, or when they make their own decisions as such. So um, that's just another uh, perspective that I wanted to add. Great, Paresh. So I think everyone has talked about uh, whatever uh, needed to be said on the subject. But I think uh, as, as Paramal Foundation, which is uh, what I call an operating foundation. So effectively, the foundation implements projects on the ground. We have about 1,500 people. And we work across education, leadership, uh, primary health, focused on maternal and child health, and drinking water and women's empowerment. So maybe I'll give a perspective based on some of the experiences that we have had. I think uh, going back to what Susie was mentioning, what Jinesh mentioned, and what uh, Anuradha just talked about, there are obviously issues that the government has kind of uh, worked on, programs that the government has developed over a period of time. Uh, there's funding that the government has set aside. A lot of that closely aligns with the MDGs that uh, the UN talks about, whether it's women's empowerment, whether it's maternal mortality, child mortality. I think based on the work that we have been doing, let's say I'll take the example of education. And we work across uh, 1,200 government schools in Rajasthan, Gujarat, and Mumbai. And our entire intervention is focused on headmasters saying, how do we create better leadership capacity in these schools? Now, the two aspects of leadership that we focus on amongst uh, the other, uh, I'm, I'm leaving out the ones which are not relevant to this conversation. But I think the two that we focus on, for instance, is what we call social leadership. And especially given that we work in rural areas, the fact that the headmaster has a lot of say with the community, and how do you engage the community in improving the facilities in the school, the school management committee, in places like Rajasthan, which is a large part of our work, how do you ensure that girls stay in school, and so on and so forth. I think becomes a very important point. The second one is what we call personal leadership. Saying what, I am, what am I here for, what is my higher purpose in life, and how do I relate to each individual who comes in my life. Now, having done this program over the last five years, there's a fair amount of learning that we've developed, and it's now leading to a stage where I think to go back to the question that you asked about uh, advocacy, uh, it's now uh, kind of getting to a stage where we are actively working with the central government in the Ministry of HRD to say this is a model of school leadership that we are focused on. These are the direct impacts, these are the secondary impacts that it's coming up with. And maybe you want to look at that. And our project director who heads uh, education, Aditya Nataraj, sits on the advisory council of the National Council for School Leadership. We are working with five states today in helping them develop their entire focus on school leadership as we see it, including community leadership and personal leadership. And to that extent, it's leading to some kind of a change in the government's thinking on how they look at education policy overall. So the point I'm trying to make is, I think you have to draw a good connection between MDGs, to my mind, government programs that exist on the ground, and uh, Anuradha spoke about those, 
Can we change those overnight? Obviously not, but based on the experience and based on the work that we are doing, can we start influencing government thinking in a very positive manner to change tack over a period of time and to frame the policy in a manner that it can be much more forward looking rather than just reactive. Uh, so I think that uh, possibly was, uh, has been our experience. I spoke only about education. There are other areas that we focus on. We're doing some work with you folks uh, on the adolescent girl parts, but we can come back to that later. Great, great. Uh, I'd love to have the audience again participate, and we've had a lot of new people join in, which is fantastic. Uh, so if anyone has questions, yes, sir, and then we'll go. I've been in social enterprise for about seven years now. Um, the first venture that I was part of wanted to eradicate kerosene, a problem uh, you know, faced by about 1.2 billion people. Today, it's one of the big success stories. It's impacted about 25 million people, but that's 2% of the problem. We are very good at talking about these large numbers, 110 billion, as you put it. Uh, you know, it's kind of a little bit disturbing to see that we talk these big numbers, but the percentage of impact after all these years is pretty minuscule. So my question is, uh, it reminds me of, Gandhi, one more point would be, the, you know, Gandhiji's speech at the International Congress was, uh, India lives in its villages. You know, we are here in an elitist, myself included, you know, a gathering of people. We are not getting our entrepreneurs, the social impact people from the villages, the people who can actually make a difference in their community. We, there is effort going on, but it's very small compared to the size of the problem. What will it take to get 10,000, 100,000 social entrepreneurs from their local communities to start, you know, ventures over there? So, so I guess the, the crux of the question, sorry, the mic wasn't as clear up here on stage. No, um, but the, the crux of the question, I guess, was how do you, I mean, many social entrepreneurs, I guess, are doing their, you know, their own good thing at a smaller scale, uh, but how do we sort of get hundreds of thousands of them together to create greater impact and actually sort of solve some of these, uh, these issues that exist, especially from the local communities? So how do we enable local communities to take care of themselves versus us being top down? Social, communi social entrepreneurs from their communities themselves. Got it. Anybody would like to take So maybe I'll uh, possibly yeah, yeah. give an example. I think uh, some of the work that we are doing on safe drinking water. Let, let me take that as an example and kind of uh, showcase uh, how, how this can work. Uh, all of us know about the statistics that 70% of rural India drinks water from untreated sources. Uh, more than 30% of the women have to walk more than a kilometer to fetch water. Huge challenges. The government focuses on centralized solutions which involves laying down pipes. Now that's very capital intensive. Uh, you have to wait for the government to assign a budget and so on and so forth. So the focus that we have had, for instance, on drinking water is creating a decentralized solution. And when I say decentralized, it's effectively, the filtration technology is pretty standardized. I don't think we need to innovate on that. But what we have done is over a period of time, our team at Servagel has actually gotten, uh, has developed what we call a remote sensing uh, equipment, which sits within the filtration unit. So the team sitting in Ahmedabad has full data about this machine, about the quality of water, about the health of the machine, when the membranes are due for cleaning, preventive maintenance, and so on and so forth. And how do we actually make it work? We can't be across the country. I think everyone has that limitation. So we actually work with rural entrepreneurs, franchisees, to find someone from the community who believes that this is a good service that he or she should be providing, is willing to invest some amount of money, and to that extent is able to create not just safe drinking water for the community, but also ensure that there's some employment that gets generated. Now that's tapping into some entrepreneurial energy in that community. Now that's possibly, you might say, that's top down. We believe there's a requirement for water, so we are doing that. There's also a need from the community. How does one do that from the bottom up? I think uh, you look at examples like Jaipur Rugs Foundation and working with communities which are actually helping. Uh, Jaipur Rugs Foundation actually provides technical support, training, material for women or for folks who, to make carpets, right? And then they take back the carpets and sell them in the open market. So they're actually creating uh, an ecosystem 
where you are creating some kind of an opportunity for the rural community. Now you could have someone uh, coming up and saying, I will take on that responsibility over a period of time. But I think it's really examples like these, can these stand on their own two feet from day one? That could be challenging. So I think you need partnerships which can nurture them, incubate them, help them grow, think through the business model. Uh, I think that that is uh, possibly the demand that I see uh, in a very large sense. I, I think that one of the aspects of the issue is uh, the lack of information on all that. I mean, the social enterprise world is not very well covered by the press. Uh, at the Thompson Reuters Foundation, we try to cover the underreported issues, namely women's rights, corruption, um, human impact of climate change, and social enterprise indeed. And, and um, when you can shed light on, on issues and have people interested, then you, you, you start to have things moving. And I will give just one example. We did, uh, we did three years ago a poll on uh, women's rights. And we asked to gender specialists around the world what were the five worst countries for women to live in. And uh, no big surprise, Afghanistan was number one, Congo was number two, you still have a rape every 10 minutes, so, and total impunity. Uh, Pakistan was number three, but India was number four before Somalia. And this was a big shock worldwide. So we were, you know, all over the televisions, etc. How is it possible that the biggest democracy in the world uh, is such a bad place for women to live in? And then the year after, we did a second poll, which was the ranking of the G20 countries. And India came last. And they came last after Saudi Arabia, which was another shock. Uh, it was two years ago. And, and the reason why gender experts put India last was that the six questions we were asking, which were the, the six CEDO principles, which is access to education, access to health, access to finance, etc. In Saudi Arabia, women have very few rights. They cannot drive a car, they cannot do gymnastics, they cannot uh, do anything without a male guardian. But they have access to education, to finance, to health, etc where in India it's less well shared, so India came last. What has happened is that many groups in India have used these um, polls to do advocacy and ask mm. for change. Mm. And then last year there was the gang rape in Delhi, the horrendous gang rape, and so it, it went on, on the worldwide scene that India was not such a great country for women to live in, and that violence was uh, you know, something uh, very important. So what I mean by that is that very often you lack data. Uh, violence against women is typically that. You don't have data because women, when they are raped, they don't run to the police station because it could be worse for, for them and for the family after. So you don't have data. In that case, is anything that puts together information like a perception poll or, or something else or data it is crucial. And this is why now I have at the foundation a big team of journalists covering these underreported issues and also two data crunching journalists because with investigative journalism, the data crunching is absolutely crucial. And all the issues you speak for, the local communities, etc., it's something that never come to light on the, on the general scene. And it should be because this is where the forces are. Okay, well, I have one yeah, short thing to add to this. I think my interpretation of the question was, how do we spark you know, an entire revolution of social entrepreneurs working on this versus just a, a, a small group of us investing in one enterprise or two enterprises? And I actually think that um, this is a great example of what I understand they're trying to do with the Startup Wave platform that they uh, announced here at Sankalp, which is, an attempt to bring some basic uh, educational resources to rural communities about how to start a social enterprise and to link them to mentors through virtual mentoring. So, because I think a big uh, limiter of that kind of uprising is that um, in rural communities, people just 
don't know, how do I start a social enterprise? And you know, uh, how do I find any funding? And what should I do? And so I think the Startup Wave platform was intended to try to bring scale uh, to, to you know, these movements. Can I would like to hijack? I, oh, sorry. Well, I'm actually going to have the audience now <laughs> hijack it and ask more questions. Thank you. I would like to give. I am Dr. Ambrose from Chennai. Actually, I thought of giving this information yesterday itself. Anyhow, it's the right time to give the information thanks to Sankal. So in India, we have empty number of NGOs. We have formed nearly 100,000 NGOs in our network. It's called Indian NGOs Network. Uh, last year onwards, I am the chairman for the network. We have all sorts of programs and coordinating with the NGOs from childhood to... Sorry, sir, what's your question? Just because we have three minutes no, no, and 46 just, seconds. It, it's a good platform to have a good network with the NGOs. Fantastic. Whatever may be the investors or CSR, whatever may be the things, just you can have in touch with that network, you can have very good development in India because nearly Great. 100,000 NGOs in our network. It is called Indian NGOs Network. So you will be having a very good site on this Great. network. Thank you. So again, for networks, me. bringing various stakeholders together is really important. We have one yeah. question in the back, um, in the very back, and then we may have time for one last question. Yes. Thank you. This is actually just piggyback, piggybacking on the previous question and, and what our friend from Pyramid Foundation was saying. Um, how do we, I want to know about outreach that you are doing so that we actually get two practitioners on the ground. I really think, actually I'm very hopeful and I, I believe that there are a lot of enterprises in the local communities and there are networks uh, or partnerships that are being created. But how do we get you to be actually being outreaching to, you know, not tier one and tier two cities, but really the most remote uh, communities where there are people who are trying to do things and, and I think startup way will reach to a certain extent, but I really don't see, you know, how we'll have somebody sitting in Nagaland actually get access to the kind of support that they need. And really it's about the ecosystem again. I think it needs to be the investors and the philanthropists and the, uh, the you know, VCs coming together to support them. It's not going to be one or the other. And so how are you jointly working together and, and actually outreaching to the most remote areas? So. If I can take that question, I would answer, so I just talked about a company called iMerit. It is located in, uh, in West Bengal, in the 24 Parganas. Um, so, the, the, so we do reach, it's not that we don't, but what's the vehicle to reach? If you're talking about philanthropists, in, uh, investors and others to reach, it always is through a vehicle, right? So multiple vehicles, when they get created, you always start seeing that there is greater activity which, which, gets hap uh, which happens out there. It's at different levels, that, uh, different levels of capital that play in that, right? Philanthropists play in earlier stages where it's not about the scale but about the impact and the definition of that. Uh, there is philanthropic capital which actually comes in and says that, you know, like, how do you convert this impact into something which is viable and sustainable? And then comes the uh, investor's wave which says, okay, there are sustainable enterprises in here which can then be scaled into multiple parts of the, of the country as such, right? So it is just different stages of capital which need to be reaching out there. And you've consist and in, in India as such, in terms of the organized financing, if you can call it that market, it's, it's fairly nascent, it's like, in the, it's very new, right? So therefore the, the concentration has been in those areas where it's already been possible. Now you're seeing the first philanthropic wave actually moving outside of the tier, uh, tier one uh, cities and moving into tier two. In fact, quite a few of colleagues that I know in the venture capital industry have invested in businesses which are not urban at all. That includes me. Um, so there is an awareness, but for the awareness to actually concretize into a large wave, takes some time and the, we, we can't speed, it, uh, speed up that process because it, then it, the infrastructure requirement also needs to be set, in, set into place as such. Uh, so we are playing at multiple levels uh, and all of us I guess like around this table are working together in a, in a sense to mobilize the different stages of capital which are required for the different kinds of investments. Yeah, there. I just want okay. to add one perspective. Yeah, I, I think 
Every time when we go for conference, it's a social entrepreneur's thing that people on the dais need to do something. The problem also lies with the social entrepreneurs. When they think about doing anything, they do it very micro level. They never think about scale, they never think about going beyond what their local area is. So guys, it's also up to you, how do you really think about scaling it up? And when you are really thinking of scaling it up, I think investors are going to be behind you. Well, that's definitely easier said than done. But I think one contribution I have to this conversation is um, you know, to think about how we can use mobile technology to bring information to you know, more remote communities. So I think an innovation that we brought to the social enterprise space with our competitions is that the way you enter the competition, you create a venture profile, which is an online profile describing your social enterprise, and that is visible to everybody. So over the past seven years, we've actually built a database of 25,000 different ventures, and the idea over time is that this could actually become a place where others can look for ideas, and you don't have to create a new social enterprise in every community that wants to solve a problem. You can say, oh look, this one is already proven, it's doing really well. And so I think in an, another way to build upon this would be, you know, how could rural entrepreneurs search via their cell phone, you know, enterprises serving adolescent girls, and then maybe click on there and read about it and get connected to some resources. But how can we use technology plus the success stories that we already have to make it a lot easier for um, rural wannapreneurs uh, to actually be able to get started. Great. Well, I think we're going to have to call the panel to a close. Uh, thank you guys for being engaged in this conversation. We're still very much around, and we'd be happy to answer questions on an individual basis. Thank you, panelists, yep. for, for coming today. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.